Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's get at it. It's been a few days. Let me say this. You know, the world is interconnected economically. You need to be paying, if you're a boxing fan, if you're a sports fan, you need to be paying very close attention to what's happening in Greece. To simplify things quite a bit, just understand that because of this crisis, debt is going to be harder to come by. In other words, if you're a mogul and you're trying to pay in advance to a boxer, you're trying to get money so you could promote a boxing event, right? You're trying to, you know, literally <clears throat> create economic activity, but you need financing from banks to do it. Just understand, because of this Greek default, that could start dominoes falling. Right? When you go to the bank, they're going to look at your financials, your credit worthiness, a lot more seriously. Understand it's in moments like this that you find the purses being bid at purse bids to drop. Mickey Bay is a champion. There was recently a purse bid for a title fight for him that was won with a bid of less than a hundred thousand dollars right if you believe there's a lot of money in boxing if you're fooled by all of these big purses being publicized in a very small number of events if you don't realize that there are champions out there being offered peanuts being offered less than they would make if they had a good job at the post office long term then I encourage you to look at the recent purse bid. Uh, Mickey Bay decided to vacate his title because he didn't want to make a small amount of money traveling to Macau to face a dangerous opponent whose style would have been a problem for him. So just keep that in mind. Google it. I encourage you to do it. Right? Let's, we're always on the hunt for new talent. Let me just throw a name out there. I encourage you to Google this fighter. He's an interesting one. Luis Cuba Arias. Right? I want you to give this guy a very hard look. Understand he has an excellent amateur pedigree. He's unbeaten. He used to be a Mayweather gym fighter, but because of politics, he got pushed out of the Mayweather gym. Understand, boxing isn't fair. Boxing is political. The few people in boxing who have some money are going to use it to get their way, right? For whatever reason. Understand, Arias got pushed out of the Mayweather gym for political reasons. Uh, he now has somehow hooked up with one of boxing's best trainers, John David Jackson. You may have seen his recent work, Chris Algieri, in uh, fight against Amir Khan. I personally thought Algieri won that fight, you know, at a minimum, at a minimum. Your takeaway from that fight should be that Algieri, in a very short time frame, with a new trainer, lifted his game exponentially. Right? Were Algieri to fight Khan again, trust me, that fight would be... A blockbuster on a host of levels right let me also say this too there is no book on boxing that every trainer follows if I were to get superstar trainers in a room right Virgil Hunter John David Jackson uh, Joel Diaz Robert Garcia Nacho Beristain uh, Nassim Richardson uh, Don Turner right understand that they would agree on very little right obviously they would agree on basic things like protect yourself at all times but understand the games they're teaching right Freddie Roach the games they're teaching 
their students are different right John David Jackson's fighters tend to be more on the aggressive side they're using planes and stuff like that you know tuck heads the idea is I'm in front of you I'm throwing punches I'm backing you up I'm being offensive but I have things in my game a raised elbow and stuff like that it's gonna make it hard for you to hit me in the head from this angle while I'm throwing punches right now that's very different than let's say Virgil Hunter's fighters who tend to be a little bit more defensive right again that's very different from Freddie Roach fighters who tend to be quicker handed and who move around the ring a little bit more who tend to be a bit more explosive right understand you see a Robert Garcia fighter you could rest assured that that guy right has thought about pacing and a jab and what to do between punches more than the average fighter right obviously Nacho Beristain's fighters know how to counter punch you to death etc etc the point I'm making is uh, Arias's fight style with John David Jackson's fight style is simply gonna wear out a lot of boxers right this guy is a really good up-and-comer right now he wants to fight Peter Quillen right now right it might take a little bit more time right maybe he wants to be with John David Jackson longer than five minutes before he takes on you know the uh, lions in the deeper part of the forest but just know that this youngster to me has a lot going on for himself okay let's talk long term here briefly for gamblers here I personally am not buying the Tom Brady story I'm just not I could be wrong about it I'm just not buying it I don't believe he showed up at the uh, appeal with any exculpatory evidence whatsoever right none whatsoever I think he just came in with expensive lawyers and a shiny suit he smiled a few times and said you know played out the narrative he's pushing of not knowing anything right what it all means is I think he suspended week one of the season they play the Pittsburgh Steelers week one of the season if you're a gambler looking past next week if you're looking into the NFL season and you realize that Garoppolo might be up against a Steeler defense who's head coach. I know Dick LeBeau's gone, but their head coach, Mike Tomlin, his background is defensive. And when you look at the offensive numbers Big Ben put up last year, well north of 4,000 passing yards. When you look at the fact that Daryl Revis is no longer a Patriot, Antonio Brown had the biggest number of catches last year in the NFL, even though the Steelers are without Levy and Bell uh, week one, they have D'Angelo Williams. Understand that Steeler Patriot line looks like an opportunity to me this far out. But understand, football is a collision sport. We know because this always happens. Big time stars are going to be hurt in the preseason. You're going to hear about torn ACLs, right? You're going to hear about broken bones. You're going to hear about some guy who you were hoping to draft in your fantasy pool getting hurt and being out for months right the point is simply this right now the Steelers to me week one look like a very live play but obviously if Big Ben gets hurt right if other things happen other key people on that team get hurt uh, if D'Angelo Williams gets hurt and you're wondering who the Steeler wide receiver is uh, excuse me running back is if Antonio Brown gets hurt and you're wondering who Big Ben's go-to guy is, then, of course, all bets are off and you need to hedge the play, right? Okay, let me also say, too, NBA draft. I think there's misinformation out there for days, right? I'm telling you personally, when I see a guy like a Frank Kaminsky go from nothing, just look at his college stats his first year go from nothing to developing the skill set this guy has right he's lights out from three forget his height forget the fact that he's a seven footer this guy is lights out from three-point range 
Understand, too, you look at these Kentucky guys, and on different nights, different guys carried the team. How many times did you see Towns put the Kentucky Wildcats on his back? I think he's very talented. I believe I said so here online during the college basketball season. But you know what? It takes a lot to be alpha. Wisconsin, I saw numerous games where Frank Kaminsky took that team on his back. I am shocked that this guy slipped in the draft. Also, all this emphasis on defense. People are saying, who's he going to stick? Who's he going to stick? Can we be real for a moment? There are very few, very few great defensive players in the National Basketball Association. You have several stars right now. Carmelo Anthony comes to mind who are not defensively gifted, right? We're going to look at these young rookies. You're going to look at a seven-footer with three-point range who could put the ball on the floor and who has back-to-the-basket skills. You're going to say he's not good enough defensively? you got to be kidding me. I thought Carolina made out like a bandit getting Frank Kaminsky. Let me say this, too. I'm not a big Cauley Stein fan. I'm not. But now you're putting him with DeMarcus Russell in Sacramento. That back, excuse me, that front court just became hellacious, right? I think the Sacramento Kings deserve a hard look. I'm not saying they beat the Golden State Warriors. I'm not saying they win the West. All I'm saying is they have improved themselves. If George Carl can just dip that ego a little bit, and work with Vlade Divac and the owner, Sacramento has a lot of upside. They certainly have the talent on the roster. Of course, all of this could change if someone tears an ACL and is unavailable. Let me uh, say this, too. Um, unbeaten fighters. This is the risky part of the Internet, right? This is the gambling part of the Internet. I bet against two unbeaten fighters last weekend. Let's talk about both of those matches. Let me say this. Dominic Wade. I bet against him. I took Sam Sullivan. I encourage you to look at that fight. In my opinion, Wade lost the fight. Solomon was the underdog. Wade was the bigger than two to one favorite. Right? Just know that the copy box numbers favor Solomon. When you look at the fight, you're going to see that Dominic Wade had no idea how to deal with Solomon's entry point. This doesn't even show up on the CompuBox numbers. Right? Let's just say Solomon's fainting, fainting, faint, then he comes inside. Dominic Wade, to me, seemed to be unprepared for that round after round. He couldn't match Solomon's volume. He couldn't match his energy. He just couldn't figure out his timing. Now, he's not the first person. Solomon has built a career on this, right? I don't care who officially won the fight. Going forward, guys who faint a lot and who know when to come in, right, are going to give Dominic Wade problems, right? The young man's going to have to work on his game. He had a big amateur career. He's in his mid-20s. I was surprised to see. In fact, I wasn't that surprised to see it. That's why I took Solomon. Let's just say he's behind the eight ball in terms of figuring out how to deal with that fight style. As for Solomon, you need to realize he's competitive against the upper echelon of the sport. He is a walking live underdog. I don't care who they put him in the ring with. Right? Peter Quillen, Andy Lee. Uh, keep in mind, this is a guy who already beat Felix Stern, right? Understand, Solomon has been in the ring with great fighters. He, I believe he fought Anthony Mundine, right? So just view me as a skeptic of the official decision in the Solomon case. Obviously, the casino is not going to give me my money back. Officially, it was a split decision in favor of Dominic Wade. I have no doubt that if that fight took place in Australia... Sam Solomon wins it by at least three rounds. Uh, let's shift gears. I bet against another unbeaten fighter. Right? Jesse Vargas. Jesse Vargas lost. 
right? More beer for us. Timothy Bradley came in. Timothy Bradley brought it. Vegas had Bradley as the favorite in that fight for a reason. Right? For a reason. Let me say this. Vargas fought Alec Verdia, a fight I thought he lost. Judges disagreed with me there. Okay, hey, that, you know, that's fine. This is boxing. You know, the judges have their take. Their take is the one that matters, right? Their take is the one that decides whether or not the casino pays you unless the fighter you bet on scores a KO. Fair enough. But understanding that Alec Verdia fight, I thought Alec Verdia threw more volume than Jesse Vargas. I thought he was more active. I thought Vargas was a little bit too upright. He wasn't mobile enough, too vertical, not horizontal enough, didn't move around the ring enough, didn't have a lot of ring coverage. Vargas doesn't have a big punch, right? I know there's controversy about the end of the fight. There should be controversy about the end of the fight. Vargas has a great argument. I back Vargas about the end of the fight. In other words, unfortunately, the referee who had done a great job up until that part of the fight made a mistake that might have caused Vargas to fight. I don't think it did, but we won't know. Vargas lands a great right hand. Somebody's gonna have to tell Timothy Bradley after the ending of the Provotnikov fight and the ending of this fight that the punches in the 12th round that land on him count too. I don't know I don't know what Bradley is doing there to get hit with a right hand. Right? Why are you close to Je Jesse Vargas in a fight you've dominated? But you know the rest. Bradley's a warrior. You can't take the fight out of the man even when it makes common sense to do so. So what's Bradley doing? He's there duking it out with Jesse Vargas. He gets caught with a right hand. Right? He gets hurt with the right hand. Now he's lucky he's fighting Vargas and not Provotnikov. Vargas then tries to open up the woodshed. Vargas sees he's hurt Bradley. He has a chance at a stoppage. Right? The referee then stops the fight. The referee, a bit confused, thought that the bell had rung for the end of the fight. Jesse Vargas's argument is simply, look, boxing is a 12-round affair for a championship fight like this. I had 36 minutes to beat Timothy Bradley, not 35 minutes and change. I had Bradley hurt at the end of the fight. This is a fighter who's been down in other fights, right? He was down against Provodnikov. He was down against Kendall Holt, right? Timothy Bradley has been knocked down in his career, right? Vargas is simply saying, look, this was one of the key moments for me in this entire fight, and the referee deprived me of it. I agree with that. Right? I thought Bradley dominated the fight, but if the boxing commission wants to call this a no contest, I don't think anybody could have a beef. Right? If the boxing commission wants to order a rematch between these two, right? I don't think anybody really could have a beef. You can't have a ref step in when a guy is hurt and prematurely stop a fight, but yet that's what happened here. Right? It's even worse than that. The ref prematurely stops the fight, and of course it benefits the hurt guy. It doesn't benefit the guy who has the other guy hurt. This isn't a premature stoppage where the ref then says, hey, Carl Frotch, I'm awarding you this fight over George Groves. Right? The first one. George Groves gets dazed. Ref jumps in. Then the ref says, Carl, you're the winner. Could you imagine if that ref would have jumped in and then said, George Groves, you're the winner. Because I made a mistake. <laughs> because I thought this was the end of the fight. That's what happened here. 
right? So let's just say, I think this is a situation where a fighter is crying foul and he has a compelling argument. I'm not saying Vargas should be awarded the fight. Timothy Bradley wasn't KO'd, right? Timothy Bradley never hits the canvas. I believe Bradley when he says, hey, I was lucid, right? You know, I wasn't dazed and confused to the point where I was in danger, right? The point, though, is we should have seen the last few moments of this fight play out. We shouldn't be forced to take any fighter's word for it. When it came to the action, Bradley wins by a wide margin, right? Jesse Vargas can't handle his angles. He's coming in low. He's throwing a lot of punches. He's inside. He's setting a pace Vargas can't match, right? But Vargas has a compelling argument. And keep in mind, this was for a title. Let me shift gears. Floyd Mayweather seems to be losing it these days. Uh, best fighter in boxing. You know I believe that. He's fighting for history. You know I believe that. But, really, good promoters understand proper incentives for fighters. I don't understand what Sean Porter, who is one of the most viable opponents right now for a title fight against a host of guys, right? Think about Kell Brook's entire career. If I ask you for the toughest fights Kell Brook has had, Kell Brook's a title holder, many of you will say the first Carson Jones fight. Many of you will say the Sean Porter fight, where Kell Brook lifts his title by decision. Right? Understand, Sean Porter is a guy who doesn't have to fight again to warrant a title shot. He's a guy who networks and fans will want to see in title matches. He's not trying to get there. That's his status right now. Right? If he's old school, he can travel around and show up at fights for people like Kell Brook, Keith Thurman. He's a guy entitled to sit, you know, near ringside and to say, hey, you know, Kell, when are you going to fight me again? That first fight's razor close. You have the title. The fans want to see you face real competition. Here I am. You know, put me in the ring. Get me out of the front row and into the ring. Let's do this. I'm here. Remember me. Understand, too, Sean Porter is a guy who has taken care of himself. He used to weigh more. Right? You can imagine if the right opportunity came by at 154, I get the feeling Sean Porter would be a professional and would show up in shape on fight night, ready to challenge for that title. So what's Floyd Mayweather doing offering Sean Porter a fight against Errol Spence? How's Errol Spence supposed to help his career? Am I, am I missing the belt Errol Spence has? You got to be kidding me. I hear Floyd also has offered an Errol Spence fight to Keith Thurman. Didn't we just see Keith Thurman in the ring against Robert the Ghost Guerrero? You know, maybe Floyd doesn't know it, but Sean Porter and Keith Thurman want to fight him. Understand, the problem with getting old is there reaches a point where younger guys start to feel you're not relevant. That what you've done in the past isn't something you'd be able to do if your career started today. Porter and Thurman are thinking about fighting Floyd. That's the fight they want to be offered. They don't want to be offered Errol Spence. Why would they put their reputations on the line for a guy who doesn't have a title? Right? Isn't their mandatory? Right? So, well, put it this way. People will figure it out. Let me say this. So let's talk about Mayweather. I've been here online. I've been reading people talking about who Mayweather should fight next. 
right? Let me say this. Style-wise, you know, I still maintain, even after the Chris Algieri debacle, that Amir Khan's style gives Floyd Mayweather all he can handle. Understand, the Chris Algieri debacle happens because Algieri is on his front foot throwing high volume. He's fighting a John David Jackson style of fight. By the way, another fighter who was very high volume and who overwhelmed a technical guy was another John David Jackson fighter, Sergei Kovalev against Bernard Hopkins. Right now, I'll agree, Algeria had some great moments against Khan. My question to the boxing cognoscente is simply, when is the last time you saw low-volume Floyd Mayweather on his front foot throwing high volume like that? Right? If you can't come in and engage Amir Khan and be on your front foot forcing him backward, aren't you going to be having a different experience in the ring? So if Floyd wants an entertaining, fascinating fight for the boxing hardcore, for boxing purists, I think a fight against Amir Khan would be a great fight. But let me say this. I know Oscar De La Hoya feels that Mayweather should fight Sean Porter, right? I think a fight against Sean Porter would be a great fight, but if Mayweather is going for legacy, right, if he is going for legacy, then I believe he needs to consider fighting top ranks best welterweight. And no, longtime viewers here online, no, I don't think that's Manny Pacquiao. Right? We saw what happened in the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight. No, I think top ranks best welterweight is a guy who has already beaten Pacquiao. Has beaten Juan Manuel Marquez. Beat an unbeaten Devin Alexander. Beat an unbeaten Lamont Peterson. Beat Richland Provotnikov in a fight of the year. Beat Miguel Vasquez. Just beat unbeaten Jesse Vargas. Now I'll say this, understand the risk involved. And it's huge. It's perhaps too big. If Mayweather were to fight Timothy Bradley, and if Mayweather were to lose to Timothy Bradley, I'm telling you that the history books would be rewritten. I'm telling you Mayweather would lose his legacy much more than he would if he were to lose to Amir Khan. If he loses to Amir Khan, the argument is, hey, young lion, beat a guy in his late 30s. Okay, fine. But understand, Amir Khan has had difficult fights. The Chris Algieri fight. Amir Khan's been dropped on the canvas. Right? The Danny Garcia fight. The Breeders Prescott fight. Right? A fight against Amir Khan isn't a fight for supremacy of the era. It wouldn't be interpreted that way. I'm telling you, interpretations happen years later when people look at the data. The problem with fighting Timothy Bradley is Bradley's only lost once, and that was against the guy who he had previously beaten. Think about that. Right? I'm telling you, if you sit down now and look at that first Bradley Pacquiao fight, it looks awfully different than it did the night of the fight. When many people thought Pacquiao won that fight. Right? More importantly, because of Timothy Bradley's body of work, the elite fighters he has beaten, right? Lamont Peterson has had belt. Right? Marquez, Boxing Hall of Famer. Right? Peterson might be too down the road. Right? Devin Alexander has had belt. 
right? Miguel Vasquez has had a belt. Ruslan Provodnikov has had a belt. Just to understand that if Timothy Bradley were to go in the ring and were to beat Floyd Mayweather, there is a group of you who would then say, you know what? One man beat Mayweather and Pacquiao. They're going to go back. They're going to notice that he gets off the canvas to beat prime Kendall Holt. Right? I'm telling you, as you start to look at the careers, a lot of people are then going to say, well, who owned the era? Pacquiao, who lost to Bradley and Mayweather? Mayweather, who lost to Bradley? Or Bradley, who beat them both? Right? Folks are going to sit down and they're going to start to say things because this is the way boxing history works. They're going to say things like, why didn't Floyd fight Devin Alexander? Why didn't Floyd fight Lamont Peterson? Why didn't Floyd fight Richland Provotnikov? Right? Understand, Bradley still has time to go back and fight. Marcus Maidana, Robert the Ghost Guerrero, Saul Alvarez, right? So, if I'm Floyd Mayweather, if I want to throw caution to the wind, if I want to take the highest risk fight possible for legacy, at this stage, I believe that fight is against Timothy Bradley, who has just been in the ring war for a longer period of time at the professional level than Sean Porter. Now let me say this too. Let me agree with Cal Brook. I'll agree that Cal Brook is an awfully dangerous fight for Floyd Mayweather. I'm not necessarily saying here that Timothy Bradley is the toughest opponent. I'm not saying that at all. Right? I'm not saying Timothy Bradley is a tougher opponent than Cal Brook. What I'm saying, though, is if you look at the resumes of the two guys, and I understand Kell Brook's unbeaten, right? Tim Bradley's the person who has fought the more historical names at this stage of their careers, right? Marquez, Pacquiao twice, Lamont Peterson, who I believe is going to go on to bigger and better things, right? So, um... Floyd also needs to remember Larry Holmes. Boxing's a brutal business from a legacy standpoint. Understand, Holmes was in the division, the heavyweight division. He was unbeaten, just like Mayweather is right now. Understand, the dialogue we would be having would be fundamentally different if Larry Holmes had beaten Michael Spinks and then walked away from the sport. Many people, as it was, thought Larry Holmes beat Michael Spinks. I encourage you to look at the scoring of their first fight. Right? We would look back on Holmes's career, and people would start to say, wow, he did beat Ken Norton, didn't he? He did beat Ali, didn't he? He did beat an unbeaten Jerry Cooney didn't he? Right back then we had no doubt that if Larry Holmes had fought George Foreman who was out of the game, right, he would have beaten George Foreman. Right? Holmes beat Ernie Shavers. Holmes was unbeaten. Now while I personally feel Larry Holmes is one of the best heavyweights I have ever seen in my life, while I personally believe Larry Holmes's jab is one of the best jabs in any weight class in boxing history, that's not how he's referred to on shows. Right? Other guy, George Foreman, is viewed more fondly. They call Ali the greatest. I'm telling you. Larry Holmes used to be Ali's sparring partner. I'm telling you, Larry Holmes knew he was going to beat Ali 
at least a year before the two men fought based on their sparring right the fact that Holmes was unbeaten when he faced Michael Spinks a guy who wasn't even a cruiserweight he was a light heavyweight is completely lost in history right now Mayweather's unbeaten status is big news it's big we're all thinking about it that could go away if he loses to the wrong opponent if he loses in a way where we feel that he has lost Larry Larry Holmes lingered on he fought Spinks again he lost the rematch he retired got talked into coming back against a fighter you might remember who we consider to be better in history than Larry Holmes but who when Holmes was in his prime may not have been Mike Tyson right understand had Larry pulled the plug earlier his legacy would have been bigger if I'm Floyd Mayweather Larry Holmes is the person in history I think about right Floyd quite frankly would be better off having a soft fight against a beatable opponent and then fading into the sunset than having a hard fight against a guy like Timothy Bradley who if Bradley wins that fight can say this is my era let me hear from you Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Think about it, too. Just imagine if Mayweather were to fight Amir Khan. Just imagine if he doesn't look as good in that fight as Chris Algieri looked. I'm telling you, Amir Khan fought a very good fighter on his back foot, Paulie Malinaji. Malinaji is one of the best boxing analysts out there. What I want you to do is to Google Malinaji's views on Amir Khan. Just Google it. The hand speed is dazzling. Beating Khan on your back foot. Good luck with that. Who's done it? Right? Breedus Prescott's on his front foot. Danny Garcia's on his front foot. Chris Algieri, hey, I'm not going by the judges' scorecards. I'm going by my scorecard. Chris Algieri's on his front foot, right? If you're not on your front foot against Amir Khan, really, what are your chances of beating him? Lamont Peterson's on his front foot, right? Could Mayweather beat Khan on his back foot? Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.